This is a CBS News special report. The flight of Apollo 10. Brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of our continuing coverage of important news events. Reporting from the CBS News Apollo headquarters in New York, correspondent Walter Cronkite. Good evening. All's going well now with Apollo 10. With another critical moment yet to come, just about 20 minutes from now, the flight of Apollo 10, though, momentarily cast the first shadow over July's scheduled Apollo 11 flight that would put man on the moon for the first time. At 11.21 tonight, about uh, 106 hours since their liftoff Sunday and 20 minutes from now, the LEM is scheduled to dock with the command module which will then return astronaut Stafford, Young, and Cernan to Earth, beginning on Saturday and for a splashdown Monday. But earlier tonight, there was a brief moment of doubt about that shot in July. More important, a question then of concern for astronauts Stafford and Cernan and their own safety there in Snoopy. As they fired to get rid of their descent stage just 13 miles above the moon, the LEM went into wild gyrations. Now, these are self-controlled men, as we've learned up there in space, but you could hear the tension in the voice of Gene Cernan when he reported that it felt like we were going all over the landscape, and we heard nothing from Stafford as he fought the controls to bring those gyrations under control. And through those dramatic moments, you had to ask if 11 could go on schedule, if this first uh, rendezvous in Luber lunar orbit uh, demonstrated something that uh, we didn't know. However, Mission Control in Houston now says that the frightening moments, and they were certainly frightening to all of us, resulted from a technical oversight regarding a switch, nothing more. So after that first major scare of this epic flight, we're waiting to bring you history's first man docking in a lunar atmosphere. At this moment, we're waiting for them to come around from the far side of the moon. The acquisition of signal could come in about five minutes from now, and then we expect them to confirm that they have matched their velocities, this lunar module and the command module, the lunar module flying up from its low point 13 miles there above the moon to rejoin the command module. Their velocities matched 100 feet apart, that they are station keeping, and that they are prepared to go ahead at 11.19 tonight with the docking. What happened earlier this evening, at 7.33 this evening to be precise, Eastern Daylight Time, as they were just at that point 13 and a half miles over the moon, one of the most critical points of the flight because they didn't have very much maneuvering room, uh, working at 3,700 miles an hour, that close to the moon's surface. They cut loose the descent stage of this two-stage lunar module, leaving the uh, two pilots in the ascent stage to come back for the rendezvous. But as they cut loose that descent stage, suddenly the, the ascent stage in which the astronauts were gyrated wildly. What they said was, well, what Cernan said was a bad word. Uh, actually, it was the first we, word we had that there was any trouble. He said, son of a gun, or something very like that. And then he went on to say, there are wild gyrations here. And then he said, it just took off on us uh, as we jettisoned the descent stage, he meant. He went on to say, I thought we were wobbling all over the sky. We were hearing only from CERN and then brief bursts of, uh, of uh, reports from him, very little from the ground and nothing from Stafford as he fought the controls. And a little later on, CERN and said, boy, I don't know what the hell that was, baby. I tell you, there was a moment there. And then he went on to say, but we'll like, wait and talk it over a little bit later. Well, it, they found out what it was, but for a moment, uh, everyone was frightened that the whole safety of those two astronauts and of all of our moon landing program uh, was in considerable jeopardy. They can tell us what the solution was, and it came very shortly thereafter. Uh, out at uh, Grumman Aircraft, where they build this lunar module, and where they were holding their breath too, like all of us here on Earth, uh, our Chaps out there are correspondent Nelson Benton and test astronaut for Grumman, Scott McLeod. Gentlemen, what was the solution of the problem? Well, Walter, I, I guess we go first to uh, what caused that moment, and what actually caused that moment was this switch right in the middle of the instrument panel. It's a, a switch that controls, uh, has the mode control for the abort guidance system. It was in automatic, in auto. It should have been in attitude hold. And that set off a strange series of circumstances. And what did happen, Scott? Well, Nelson, as I understand it, 
because this was not an attitude hold and they expected it to be, uh, they pointed toward the command module as soon as the program was initiated. What should have happened is that they should have held their attitude during the burn. And so Stafford, he used this attitude controller, the hand controller, overrode and kept the his attitude proper. Overrode the computer. So you tell one of these computers to do something and Walter, it apparently does it even if it's wrong until you come in and make the correction. The critical situation was they had to be in the right attitude to fire to get uh, back up toward the command module and that was the attitude that they were gyrating out of. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. It should be coming around the far side of the moon this time, just uh, 100 feet apart, holding that attitude, preparatory to docking uh, in another uh, five or six, seven minutes. Uh, we'll listen in uh, to a mission control. We have them piped in here now to hear the first acquisition of signal. Station keeping as we acquire them on the 16th revolution here. This is the voice of Jack Riley, voice of mission control. We have control. capability on both this revolution number 16 and on revolution number 17 to receive television. Television is scheduled for the 17th revolution during the ascent propulsion system burn to depletion. However, the capability does exist to receive it and uh, it's possible we might have an unscheduled transmission, we're not sure. We should have AOS now on uh, Charlie Brown any second. That uh, later television Jack Riley was telling us about would come. Actually, is scheduled for about 1:35 a.m. And it uh, would be television of the of the burning of the ascent propulsion okay, system engine. Tom Stafford says, don't call us, we'll call you. They're going to be a little bit busy docking these uh, spacecraft. It's got to be done within six miles an hour, which is the absolute ultimate of speed that they could come together. And actually, it's done much, much slower than that, down under a mile an hour, around two-thirds of a mile an hour as they close. It's uh, like parking that new automobile in a garage with not very much clearance on either side. We should hear conversation uh, would be expected between uh, John Young flying the command module and Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan in the lunar module. The lunar module uh, makes the approach. Okay, John, you're into about five feet, so he's looking beautiful. should be seen out of the lunar module window in our simulation here. Got a capture? Yes, thrusters are off. We got a capture, Doc. Fire when you're ready. They have docked. Everything looks good in here, Tom. Have a capture dock. I said capture dock, which means a soft docking.
course they have. Oh, we got him. Stop, stop, stop. We got him, John. We heard him in here. Hello, yes, uh, Bippy and Charlie Brown are hugging each other. Roger that. We heard him down here. Okay, let's see. Then they fire a nitrogen. Stay helmet, babe, uh, until we get this thing spread away. Okay, John, that was beautiful. Just beautiful, babe. Tom Stafford. Okay, now, John, let me ask you one thing. Do you want me to pressurize that lift tunnel through our hat to save you from blowing that miler out again? He's talking about the difficulty they had okay, earlier. Do you want us to pressurize the tunnel? Okay. Earlier, they had difficulty depressurizing the tunnel for the undocking sequence. And now, Tom Stafford is asking John Young if he thinks they ought to attempt to repressurize the tunnel. They Man, could... we are back home. Come on. We are back home. Okay. How easily man adapts and how comparative is safety. They're 241,000 miles from the Earth, okay, and they I think they're back home. You can start helping them go the hatch. Compared to where they've been, though, they nearly are. They're now connected with the engine that can bring them home and the spaceship that can bring them home, which the lunar module... Houston, were you calling? Negative, you know, we're standing by until you got some time. Okay, Joe, uh... The nominal, or the, the, the run of it, was uh, the best sim we've ever had, right up the pike all the way. Uh, we'll talk about it later. I'm going to start uh, going through the uh, tail end of the activation checklist for the absurd and depletion, and Tom and John will start on the tunnel. Roger that. John Young working in the tunnel. They have to uh, remove hatches. Scooby, this is Houston. One thing we would like for you to do um, is go to secondary on the CO2 canister. We'd like to monitor that one uh, while you're getting uh, cleaned up there. That's the carbon dioxide. Right, Jose, it's been a long day. <laughs> Say again, Joe. Roger, Gino. We'd like for you to go to secondary on CO2 canister. We want to monitor that canister while you're getting cleaned up and back into command module. Yeah. That's a canister of lithium hydroxide, which purges the carbon dioxide from the air and... Stay alive, Joe. I, I can't... Uh, wait a minute. ...prepares it for rebreathing. The docking was absolutely perfect. Okay, now go ahead, Houston. Now stay again, your last. Roger, go secondary on CO2 canister. The voice of the capsule communicator okay, in Houston is Joe Engel. CO2 canister now. Roger, thank you. Position that uh, Tom Stafford apparently put to okay, John Young. John, uh, how do you want to work the tunnel? Do you want to pressurize it, or do you want me to? Was that? Okay, we got plenty of pressure. Okay, that's better. Okay, go ahead. You pressurize it. So the tunnel is going to be pressurized from the command module, which means that they remove the command module hatch, leave the hatch on the lunar module side of the three-foot tunnel, pressurize the tunnel to equalize the pressure between the two spacecraft before removing the final hatch. At that time, then, the two spacecraft Hello, will be... Hello, Houston, this is Snoopy. One thing, uh, Charlie Brown is getting them ready to pressurize the tunnel and uh, we want to make sure we're in the right attitude and everything uh, for the, uh, the next maneuver. So the, the next thing that he needs to know are the angles, over. Okay, we'll get them for you, Snippy. Okay, uh, Charlie Brown, uh, Snoopy, this is Houston. Uh, your CSM gimbal angles are roll 300, pitch 071. There it's <laughs> You can see they have placed on a screen in one of their display panels a picture of Charlie Brown and Snoopy. Okay, I got those for and unfortunately, from here, we can't read what the little balloon says. I imagine it's congratulations. They're back together and Snoopy's come home. They say it says smack. I guess I can barely see that now, now that they tell me what it says. Smack. <laughs> 
Charlie Brown, this is Houston. Oh, Snoopy, this is Houston. Go ahead, do you have an update on the Lemway? Uh, I've got that too, Gino, but we want you to load uh, in your DAP uh, 10011 for System A. So after eight hours and eight minutes of the most dramatic events we've had in space in a long time, certainly the most dramatic well, ever around the moon, zero. Charlie Brown and Snoopy are back okay, together. One, zero, zero, one, one. It's going to be a brief reunion for your dap and also your limb weight for before Snoopy is sent off into solar zero, orbit, seven, five, having done a magnificent job, a perfect job with uh, the drama of eight minutes of wild gyrations having been human error. Roger, limb weight is 7544. Four. Which perhaps we did not point out a little earlier. It was uh, attributed to a failure to place uh, in the flight plan uh, a throwing of a switch. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. Well, at this moment, uh, Tom Stafford and Eugene Sermonen, having flown closer to the moon than man has ever flown before, to within 10 miles of the moon on their first pass this afternoon, 13 and a half miles on the second pass, which for eight minutes of wild gyrating of their spacecraft gave all of us on the ground a near heart failure and obviously shook them up a little bit too. They are back safely now connected to the command module. They will uh, remove the hatches after pressurization. They will prepare the lunar module for jettisoning, uh, for being dropped from the command module and then set it up so that they can fire by remote control its uh, ascent engine again and send it into a solar orbit its work having been completed. In about uh, 45 minutes to an hour from now, they should be climbing back into the command module and uh, let poor old Snoopy go bye-bye. Uh, uh, Bruce Morton at the uh, Manned Space Center can tell us about what went on today in some homes in Houston, in the outskirts of Houston, uh, where they were watching this flight very carefully, believe you me. And if we had our moments of palpitating hearts, uh, I'm sure they did there too. Bruce? Walter, it's uh, the kind of a day that uh, here you've been down here on the shots and you know what I mean. It's sort of like a club. The, the wives gather and there are always friends uh, whose husbands have been off on other space flights who can offer some reassurance. Mrs. Stafford, Faye Stafford, spent uh, virtually the whole day at home. She, I'm told, uh, does not watch television, but she does have uh, in the house one of those little speakers that relays the mission control commentary, and she's uh, been able to keep in touch that way. She's outwardly calm, uh, we're told, obviously feeling the strain. Uh, reporters, of course, have only seen her in, in brief glimpses. The other two wives got together for a short while, Barbara Cernan and Barbara Young. Um, they had a briefing from astronaut Rusty Schweikert, who was explaining to them all the intricacies of the separation between Snoopy and Charlie Brown and the later Snoopy swoop towards the moon. Uh, a number of astronauts' wives spent the rest of that day with Mrs. Young after she left the Cernans and went back to her own home. Mrs. Slayton, the uh, wife of Deke Slayton, who's in charge of the astronaut personnel, Mrs. Walter Shira, Mrs. Mike Collins, Mrs. Fred Hayes, Mrs. Jim Lovell, and Mrs. Neil Armstrong, whose husband, of course, uh, if all goes according to plan, will be the commander of Apollo 11, the moon landing ship. I have one definite indication of relaxed tensions that I can report, and that is we are reliably informed that Mrs. Stafford plans to have her hair done tomorrow. Walter? Well, while there, resting a little easier tonight, uh, knowing that the rendezvous has taken place and the docking has now taken place and their husbands shortly will be safely back in the command module, uh, John Young, who's been flying the patrol duty in the command module at 69 mile altitude throughout these uh, eight hours that the lunar module has been away, is a very busy man preparing a little at home for uh, Stafford and Cernan. And Bill Stout, Leo Krupp out at uh, North American and Downey can tell us about it. Walter, as you pointed out, even though they're going to get rid of the limb, they're very busy right now tidying it up. And not only that, they're using it as kind of a multi-million dollar wastebasket, putting a lot of things in it that they don't want to take back to Earth in the command ship. 
Leo, what do they go through at this point in shifting cargo back and forth from one to the other? Well, Bill, the first thing John's going to do is pressurize the tunnel hatch so he can remove our... He's going to pressurize the tunnel so he can remove our tunnel hatch and get up there and inspect to see that all 12 of those docking latches are engaged. Then he'll start removing the tunnel hardware so we'll have the passageway open between the two vehicles. Now, the one thing different uh, in this portion of the flight is, is that we're going to put the probe and drogue into the lunar module, and it will be strapped down in the lunar module, and we'll be jettisoned with the lunar module and go to the sun. So we will not be carrying that hardware with us anymore after do we this. Do, that? do we do that, Leo, just to get rid of that much extra weight? Uh, yes, we don't want that weight on the front end of the uh, of the command module, and uh, this is a convenient way to dispose of it. So we put it in the lunar module. What else do you put in there before breaking the two apart? Well, I don't know. I uh, would imagine the, the crew will probably take another good drink of the of the lem water before they leave, and uh, I don't know whether they'll bring that with them into the command module or leave it in the lunar module. Water without hydrogen gas? I should think they'd bring it in. Well, it has iodine and uh, may also have a little gas in their water, too, I understand. But I, I think the point of all this is, Walter, that uh, they're going to be busy in there for an hour or so, Leo, before they finally come in and button it up and say goodbye to Lem forever? Yes, they have a, uh, a lot of work to do on the Lem system to prepare it for the separation and also the uh, apps burn to depletion, which will be a ground control burn. So they do have to set up some controls in the lunar module. So it's about an hour and a half from now before they break off, and perhaps a half an hour after that, before they give it the burn that'll send it into orbit around the sun. And the people at Grumman at Bethpage, Long Island, Walter, may regret it, but that's the last any of us will see of Lem ever again. Indeed, I think we've all become rather fond of uh, Snoopy in this flight, uh, not uh, solely because of that uh, endearing code name for him and all that uh, envisions for us, but uh, because that lunar module number four, as it is called, technically has performed so beautifully. We might find out just how beautifully that uh, LEM has performed by asking Nelson Benton and Scott McLeod at Grumman Aircraft, where they build these uh, lunar modules, how they assess the LEM's overall performance today. Uh, Waller, we've been standing here trying to uh, evaluate just uh, how Lem has done, and uh, we were trying to think of some things it's done wrong. Scotty, can you think of anything? Oh, I think it's just performed superbly. I can't think of anything that it has done wrong. Uh, there was, of course, that anxious moment in there, but we find that uh, that was human error. The switch was in the wrong place because uh, putting it in the right place was not in the checklist. Uh, Lem has Lem uh, separated as it should have. It uh, it just performed just about everything as it should. Some of the cameras didn't work too well, but they're not part of the Lem. No, and now I guess, as you mentioned, it's finding its place in the sun. Well, Scott Bill Stout was saying, uh, you know, it's gone forever, but you will uh, get a look at how it performed in lots of uh, remote ways, will you not? Oh, yes, yes. There will be a lot of data that comes back from this, not just the photographic data but all of the data that has been telemetered back, and then the briefings from the crew. So, um, Walter, we're in LAM waiting for that LAM up there to go out and be gone forever, and we'll go out of here and see you again on 11, I guess. <laughs> Indubitably. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. And so the flight of Apollo 10, while not yet brought to a successful conclusion, which will come only when the astronauts are safely back on the surface of the Earth, has performed the major function of its mission. It has proved through these daring three astronauts that uh, all of the systems work properly and that there should be no reason why man cannot, perhaps as early as July, land on that picked spot on the moon's equator. This has been indeed a dramatic close to one of the most dramatic days in the history of space exploration. These are sailors of the sky, and what uh, we've seen and heard today make the great ocean voyages of the earthbound seem, well, earthbound indeed. For as the poet wrote, the crew of Apollo 10 has slipped the surly bonds of earth, 
and carried us over into tomorrow. In the past few hours, man has come closer to the moon than ever in his history. There were those terrifying moments when you could almost hear the world hold its breath when just 13 miles from the moon, the astronauts and Snoopy, the lunar module, found themselves gyrating so wildly. But most of all, it's been a day of triumph. We've shown that man and machine can work in the lunar atmosphere, that the widely debated decision to go with two manned spacecraft rather than a single giant was correct, and the problems of the day seem also to have proved out NASA's decision to go with this dress rehearsal for that magic moment in July when man finally steps foot on the moon. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News, Space Headquarters. Good night. This has been a CBS News special report, The Flight of Apollo 10. Brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of our continuing coverage of important news events. Next Apollo update tomorrow on the CBS Morning News with Joseph Benty. This is CBS.